addressing nutrition and sleep can sometimes be the slow way, but it's definitely the most lasting way when it works and it's the most long-term way to maintain good function. Welcome to the Wise Traditions Podcast, sponsored by the Weston A. Price Foundation for Wise Traditions in Food, Farming, and the Healing Arts. We are your source for scientific knowledge and traditional wisdom to help you achieve optimal health. I'm your host, Hilda Labradagor. My guest today is Dr. Ann Childers, a psychiatric physician with a special interest in helping children and adolescents restore their physical and mental health through standard psychiatric care integrated with principles of nutrition and sleep. You know as well as I do that our children and young people are struggling with physical, mental, and emotional issues more than ever. Anne's pragmatic approach is refreshing and effective. Anne, by the way, is one of our speakers at the Wise Traditions Conference in Montgomery, Alabama this fall. For information on the conference, go to wisetraditions.com. Wise Traditions is supported by Green Pasture Products, offering fermented cod liver oil, concentrated butter oil, and coconut oil, and a variety of products and blends. Go to greenpastureproducts.com. And listeners like you, we count on your donations and membership contributions to help us disseminate valuable health information worldwide. And now, on to the conversation. Welcome to Wise Traditions, Anne. Well, thank you so much, Hilda. It's great to be here. We have a really important topic to discuss today because there seems to be a rise of mental illness and behavioral problems among our children in the United States. Do you think that's so? I agree. What do you see happening? Can you give us any statistics or maybe some of your viewpoint as a person in your private practice? Yes. Actually, I think there arise in a number of problems, and there are a number of contributors to these problems. Uh, in my practice, the things that I emphasize are nutrition and sleep, and I give those each equal emphasis. But we know that now that nutrition can actually contribute to how a child sleeps. One of the things that I've noticed in my practice is a very high number of children that have low iron stores. And these children are often inattentive, hyperactive, impulsive, and they have difficulty sleeping. Many of them are restless at night. They have what's called restless leg syndrome, which is also related to iron deficiency. The other thing that I'm seeing is depression and anxiety. And believe it or not, iron deficiency and lack of sleep can contribute to that as well. So I think we're seeing a rise in a number of very treatable conditions. Now, I'm not saying that all ADHD and all sleep disturbance is related to iron deficiency, but I would say one of the key nutrients that I see deficient in children and adolescents is iron, even in the boys. I think what happens is probably during these growth spurts that they undergo, uh, they have heightened requirements for iron and they leave that mineral behind. Another deficiency that I see that contributes to kids having a less feeling of well-being is vitamin D deficiency. And here in the Pacific Northwest, that is so common because we have a lot of cloud cover mm -hmm. and we only have direct sunlight for a short time during the year. So I think these sorts of things really point to the need for a nutrient-dense diet, especially in children, and also more attention to sleep. One of the things about this is that kids aren't born with an owner's manual in hand. They have nothing to hand their parents so their parents know what to do. Yeah, we had ancient traditions and we abandoned these because we thought they were primitive, but it turns out the primitives had the key to survival throughout generations without the need for doctors and dentists. So I, I would love to see the clock turn back on that. As it is here in our modern world with our modern food ways, we do the best we can with what we've got. But I do think that nutrient density is the key to solving a lot of these problems. And is this why you said in some of your literature that you have a unique viewpoint? Is it because most doctors want to approach this with medicine? Yes, I think that's true. And one of the things in our defense, when we 
open up a medical journal, one of the things that we see are full page ads for, in the case of psychiatry, medication, full page ads. Mm. And these are the means by which journals who need money and funding get their funding. But it does set them up with an immediate financial conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. Because if they have a medication, let's say that by some miracle, we come up with this cure for ADHD that's good for every single child, but it has to do with a certain mineral. Okay, I'm, I'm just making this up. Mm -hmm. But let's say that that happened. And let's say that the full page ad is advertising a drug to improve the symptoms of attention deficit disorder. Do you think that this miracle non-drug intervention is likely to be published if the advertiser is paying a lot of money to promote their own drug? Mm, I see what you're saying. The incentive is to go with the company that's going to pay the money, not to set forth or present some other alternative that gives them no money. <laughs> Well, that's right. And I don't think that journal editors are unethical. Right. But it's been shown that even with things like cups and pens and things like this, free lunches provided by pharmaceutical companies, although we consciously think that we are immune to these kinds of influences, it turns out that subconsciously we're not. Oh, this is fascinating. Now tell me, how did you get this unique perspective to look at these things that are not being lifted up by journals and such? Yes. Well, I think it starts way back, uh, probably year 2000, when I realized that I myself was pretty ill. And sometime after that, I think within the next few years, I had a minor stroke, which is something that seems to run in my family. Both sisters are disabled from theirs. That was a, a wake-up call. My blood pressure became very high, and although I was skinny, I was skinny fat. I had a midsection that was fat, and I didn't know what that was at the time, even though I was a doctor. But it turns out that it was what we now call metabolic syndrome or prediabetes, which should be called stage 1 diabetes. Oh. And during this time, I had been using uh, non-fat dry milk as my basic protein source. It flowed throughout my diet. It was quick. It was easy. And when I had long shifts, I didn't have to do preparation. So I also was eating an awful lot of sugar because I craved it. Mm -hmm. uh, I was eating no animal fat because I thought it was going to give me a heart attack. And it very nearly disabled me. I came very close to disability. And when I realized that after going through the Weston A. Price information that it was worth a shot to try this alternative way of eating, after I had done this for a year or so, I saw such dramatic improvements in my quality of life that I thought, this has to be shared. This can't be kept to myself. I have to share it even if I think that someone may object to it or that it might not exactly be considered standard of care in the community. The standard of care in the community is something that doctors strive for. And in a way, it's supposed to be protective against things like lawsuits. Mm -hmm. And so to stray from standard of care in the community is to challenge medical science as it stands and to lay one vulnerable to something like a suit should something go wrong. For example, let's say that standard of care in my community is to take a cholesterol-lowering drug like a statin. And let's say that I tell my patient, stop your statins, you don't need them. And then within two years, they have a heart attack. You know, mm -hmm. Even if stopping the statin did not cause the heart attack, it's still a risk for a doctor. So I really had to do this because it was a, my conscience. Mm -hmm. I really had to basically get the information out that we should be eating a whole foods diet, that we should be getting off of processed foods, that we should get off of uh, refined sugars and improperly prepared refined grains. This is the message I had to get out. So the way I've done it is by 
letting people know that this is an alternative viewpoint Mm -hmm. and then let them know this. For us in Oregon, one of the things that sort of buffers us, that allows us to do a lot of this without a lot of repercussion, is that here in Oregon, naturopaths are now considered primary care. Oh. So that was an advantage. I thought that was a great advantage to me Mm -hmm. to be able to make some of the same recommendations that they would. And so that's pretty much, I, I'm no naturopath, please don't get me wrong. I don't <laughs> have all the the knowledge that they have in those areas. But I do share some things in common. And uh, I have implemented some of these things with good success, actually. Fantastic. This is so good to hear. But I um, see that you walked into it with your eyes wide open, knowing that this might get you some flack, right? <laughs> uh, yes, yes, I did. But my patients who have benefited from this are really grateful. I mean, some of them have been depressed for decades. And some of these, their children, I I see children and families, their children also have started out depressed and ended up feeling much better. So it's been really gratifying. For example, the kids were eating things like Fruit Loops. Did you know about the, it was called the Smart, I think it was called Smart Choice Program. It was about 2009 that Fruit Loops started to surface in the press as a, quote, smart choice as chosen by leading institutions and nutritionists. It was a smart choice because I think it had a little fiber in it. So I would ask these parents, what are you feeding Johnny, who's very hyperactive, cannot sit still, is wiggling in his seat, can't make it through the morning for sure Mm -hmm. after his Fruit Loops and skim milk. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they said it was Fruit Loops. And they said it proudly as if they were doing something good for their children. Mm-hmm. But they were being misled by a program that was actually sponsored by the grain companies and agricultural companies. Mm-hmm. So what I would do is, we'll call him Johnny, I would basically say, let's try something new for a week. Let's give Johnny bacon and eggs in the morning. So we find some well-sourced eggs and some well-sourced bacon. And that's what he would receive in the morning. And several times I received calls from teachers saying, can you give Johnny, please, an an extra dose of whatever you're giving him in the morning, maybe around (sighs) noon? Wow. So they were already seeing improvement and they wanted him to continue with that because maybe the school lunch wasn't providing some of these well-sourced foods that you're talking about. Yes, that's that's how I would interpret that, yes. And actually, um, what it has to do with, I think, is hypoglycemia. Because without adequate fats in our diet, we're really prone to sugar crashes. Mm-hmm. So with no fat in the milk that Johnny received, and with no fat in the Fruit Loops, and, and having the Fruit Loops being a very highly refined carbohydrate mix... Not to mention the food coloring in it, which has been shown to uh, promote hyperactivity in even normal children. Then, to me, the box of Fruit Loops, and Fruit Loops, I'm pointing them out. They aren't the only ones, but I'm just using them as an example. At that time, I just thought of them as a box of ADHD. I've heard that a lot of these companies, and it may be them too, are going toward natural colorings. Yes. But at that time, they definitely had coal tar derivatives and petroleum derivatives for food coloring, which is typical. By the way, that's throughout the food supply. A lot of the colored candies, all these things have these kinds of food colorings in them. They were challenging Johnny's metabolism with, with this uh, synthetic food. Unbeknownst to them, I, you're so right. I wish children came with the manuals, the instruction manuals, like you said, but they don't. So parents cut off from traditional diets and what's healthy and good for them, you know, are just feeding their kids what they grew up on and thinking it worked for me. And yes. actually, that leads me to my next question, Anne. Why are our children suffering with all these issues when the parents don't seem as bad off? What do you see at play there? Well, for one thing, children are growing and developing. And a child, a normal weight child, can eat as much as an adult. And yet they have to have like a nutrient density, no food wasted, no mouthful wasted. The adult may seem like they're doing okay, but we now know that 52% 
of American adults either have prediabetes or diabetes. So we're not doing okay. And by the time we're over age 65, three quarters of us have this problem. So our health is being impaired as well. Recently, a statistic came up that one in three young adults in California has uh, prediabetes. And in the pre-diabetic population, 90% don't know they have it. That is a shocking statistic. And I believe it because I see more and more young people and children coming down with older diseases, so to speak. I know 20-year-olds with arthritis and children with depression. This is just unheard of. Now, some people say a, a criticism might be, oh, well, we're just diagnosing it more. So we're, we're on the lookout for these things and labeling it. It's always been there. What would you say to that person? I don't know really how to answer that. The only thing I can say is that in my practice, I see a lot of depressed children. And when they're old enough to kind of understand what death is, right around age 9 or 10, they do talk about it. And a good number of uh, adolescents have talked about suicide. In fact, a very large, significant number, maybe one in three or more. So we're seeing an uptick in these kinds of thoughts. The other thing that I'm seeing a lot of, and I'm not sure if this is contagion or whether this is just something that adolescents are starting to naturally do is self-harm. So we're seeing kids cut who have no intention of killing themselves, but they do it to relieve stress. Yeah, so I think we are seeing a lot more distress. And we're also seeing type 2 diabetes in children as young as three years of age. One in 10 children now has non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. One in three adults has non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Some of these people will go on to have cirrhosis. We've never seen this before. This is because we have a food supply that's not serving us in terms of our health. Oh, it's so alarming. It's time to stop and thank our sponsors. Green Pasture Products produces fermented cod liver oil and concentrated butter oil in a variety of flavors in liquid gel and capsule form. They also offer organic virgin coconut oil, virgin coconut ghee, and a complete oil blend that includes all of the nourishing oils. Lastly, they produce skincare balms and various byproducts that enrich the soil and feed of farm animals. And listeners like you. Josh Meyer had this to say on iTunes. I listen to a lot of paleo, ancestral nutrition, and integrative medicine related podcasts, and this one gets right to the common ground in all of them from a down to earth and dare I say, wise perspective. Makes it easy to learn the simple concepts of feeding the human animal. P.S. This should not be classified alternative health. These traditions are as traditional as it gets. Josh, thanks for your review. We really appreciate it. And if anybody else wants to review us on iTunes, we would love it as well. Now let's return to the conversation. It's so alarming. So how do you keep from going over the edge yourself? How do you tackle these problems and these issues that you're seeing? Uh, I try to use humor, but I also let them know that I'm not the food police. And I do my best to refer them to ways that they can enhance the diet without a lot of muss and fuss. Because one of the changes since, say, the 1950s in the American family is we now have two working parents. And this is one reason that they're reaching for convenience foods. And some of these parents are working more than one job to keep the family afloat. So... Who's going to stay home and prepare all this delicious food that Dr. Childers is recommending? Right. I see. I see. One of the things that I bring up is actually a personal story. So sometimes a child or an adult is actually sugar addicted. Sugar acts in the body almost like a drug. It creates a spike, an up spike, and then a downward crash. And that's where a lot of the hypoglycemia comes in. It's just a very strong thing to put in one's body. It's just, it's too much. It's overwhelming. Yes. So sometimes I'll tell them, well, I feel your pain. About 10 years ago, I used to be such a sugar addict that I would throw away the cookies so I wouldn't eat them. Uh-huh. But if the garbage wasn't too stinky, I'd probably take them back out again and maybe eat them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> right? Oh, my but goodness. That just shows you the extent of desperation. Yes. Yeah, this is what happens when one is on a very poor nutrition diet. So going back to the children, early on you said many children are iron deficient or may have low levels of vitamin D. 
So why wouldn't a parent just give their child vitamins with extra iron or vitamin D? Well, the best way to know that the body is going to absorb it without toxicity is to change the diet. We know that long-term use of iron can promote cancer. So in young developing children, it's probably unlikely. Mm -hmm. But it's still an unnatural way to receive iron. And if they're going to keep iron stores up in the long term, they're going to have to change the diet. That's just what they're going to have to do. So we have to find out how much protein a child needs for age. And then we have to make sure that uh, red meat is included in the diet. The thing about vegetables, a lot of people say, well, can't we just be like Popeye and we'll eat some spinach or things like this? Uh, it turns out that green leafy vegetables, even if they're loaded with iron, don't relinquish their iron when eaten as readily as we think it will. Mm. We're told that it will just get iron from a serving of spinach or even better yet, raw spinach. Uh, and that doesn't really work. The other thing is that vegetables don't yield their iron easily, but will yield it more easily in the presence of red meat or something that has heme iron in it. Mm -hmm. And that is the way to do it. So children need regular servings of some kind of heme iron source. And this could be something like red meat, it could be clams, it could be oysters, but they need a readily available and readily absorbed source of iron. I do mention liver, but a lot of families just wrinkle their nose at it. Still, chicken liver, chicken liver pate, anything that has the iron source that they need that's readily available, that is the way to maintain it. Now, at first, I may go ahead and recommend that the child be seen by their pediatrician. And the pediatrician may give them a pediatric formulation for iron, mm -hmm. and that's fine. But that should be temporary until the ferritin, it's called ferritin. It's the most sensitive measure of iron stores. When ferritin is low, when it's below 50 nanograms per milliliter, anyone listening to this, write that down, five zero nanograms per ml. When it's below that, then the child is likely to be deficient in iron. So what I do is wait until the iron stores come up maybe slightly above 50 nanograms per ml, and then encourage people to just stop the iron supplementation and continue on the path of a more nutrient-dense diet. And Anne, when families take your advice to heart, start modifying their diet for their children's benefit, I bet the adults in the family see a change for the better too, don't they? <laughs> they do. And even, it's really funny, It's even if, let's say, the teenager blows off Dr. Childers, it's kind of funny to me because after about a month or so, mom's coming in looking kind of fit and trim. <laughs> <laughs> and she was struggling before with her weight or maybe some yes. health issues, right? <laughs> yes. Now she has color in her face. She's actually able to manage her teenager a lot better. Uh, she feels better. Now, are there families that say, wait a minute, we hear what you're saying about vegetables not releasing the iron that we need so easily, and yet we are vegetarians. How does that impact their family's diet? I can work with vegetarianism usually uh, so long as there are some animal products in the diet. But I do let them know that in order to make this diet nutrient dense, they're probably going to have to use a lot of dairy and also egg products. Mm -hmm. uh, they're just going to have to make that a more concentrated effort. And one of the risks is that uh, some kids really get tired of dairy and eggs. Mm -hmm. So what are you left with, you see? Mm -hmm. So anyway, but it can be done. I also encourage them to get off of soy and to watch out for alternative milks that may have carrageenan in them. Mm -hmm. So try to get them onto more pure products. It's a struggle because, again, convenience is important to a lot of families. But I definitely try for that. But my concern, of course, is that this kid's not going to get B12 without these kinds of foods. Anyway, so yeah, it is it is harder with vegetarianism and it may require an iron supplement. What I have been successful in doing with some people is converting them over to, I think, it is it 
pescatarianism. It's where they actually eat fish. Mm -hmm. And some of these people are good with that. And so that opens us up to shellfish like clams and oysters if there are no religious prohibitions or anything like that. So that could also enhance their iron sources. But you're right, it is more of a challenge. The other thing I want to make a comment about, about vegetarianism, and especially with young children, is when you eat a more plant-based diet, kids have very small stomachs but very high energy needs. So they would have to eat several times a day in order to be able to fulfill their nutritional requirements. And I think this is why I see a number of kids that are vegetarian whose parents are not aware of this, where they're really quite thin and they look quite pale and they have low energy for kids. Mm -hmm. They're not able to concentrate. They have some problems that way. So I think parents, the challenge for vegetarian parents is to become very educated about what their children need and maybe even look into supplements if that helps. Because uh, to get the same amount of calories from plants, you have to eat a whole lot more plants than you would like animal fats. Your practice focuses on nutrition and sleep. Can you just remind us what issues for children do you see resolved or improved by taking this two-prong approach? Oh, yes. Once these two things are straightened out, then anything else is probably either psychiatric or there's something I'm missing. So let's say that a kid is now getting proper nutrition and now getting proper sleep and he's still anxious. Then maybe I need to treat the anxiety. But the idea here is to try to figure out where the problems are get these two things straightened around and hopefully the anxiety resolves as well. I had a young man in my office who was 10 years old just a couple weeks ago and the parents described a number of problems and fortunately they were eating pretty well already. What I did is I got a lot of the empty calories out of the child's diet and started making it more nutrient dense and then got them on a better sleep schedule. And they came in and within two weeks they said, I said, I usually ask, well, on a scale of zero to five, where would you put his improvement? And they said four out of five. Yeah, I mean, this is like remarkable. A couple of the outside issues were things like him not laying out his clothes at night. So in the morning, there'd be kind of a tussle getting out the door. Well, that was nothing compared to the previous problems. So the parents were very, very happy with what was going on. Yeah. (laughs) So, Anne, that young man's story sounds like a great turnaround. What other symptoms or issues do children have that can be addressed by nutrition and sleep, improved nutrition and sleep? Well, certainly a lot of health problems can be addressed. And kids will complain of stomach problems and things like this. And a lot of times when they get on a nutrient-dense diet, the stomach problems go away. They feel better. They interact better. They come out of their bedrooms. They're more part of the family again. There are also a lot of uh, emotional problems. I would say key among them are uh, attention deficit disorder, anxiety, and depression. And I think these are the three things that most child psychiatrists see fill their practices up and it's so wonderful to see a child who's really nervous and having trouble concentrating suddenly uh, straighten around. I would say in the case of iron deficiency a lot of times they're at their full improvement within five months. One thing I do want to say is that addressing nutrition and sleep can sometimes be the slow way but it's definitely the most lasting way when it works and its most long-term way to maintain good function. The other thing with kids too is uh, when they're not feeling well, they don't do as well as sports, they don't keep up with the other kids, and so they feel inferior. So when kids start feeling better, a lot of times their self-confidence improves as well, and that can be the underlying problem with anxiety and depression. Oh, wow. Well, I wish we had more time. I'm sorry we only have 30 minutes or so. In closing, what would you suggest our listeners do to improve their health or the health of their children? Is there one thing in particular you would recommend? Yeah, and I think a lot of experts have said this before, so I think this will not be new. Establish a regular bedtime. Take electronics away or 
amber down your electronics. I'll just let you know there's a there's a program called F.LUX is free of charge and it will actually turn the PC screen or Mac screen amber at night. It doesn't do I think for other things. There are other electronics it isn't made for, but it's free. It's free of charge. So amber things down at night. Don't get exposed to a whole lot of blue light. Uh, otherwise, uh, you won't produce the melatonin you need to get good sound sleep. And then go for a really nutrient-dense diet. When you go shopping, shop the perimeter of the grocery store. Don't shop the middle. The middle is where the processed foods are. Go for the perimeter of the grocery store with the fresh meats, fresh vegetables, eggs, et cetera, et cetera. And don't fear animal fat. This is very important. Make sure your animal fat is well-sourced. Animals on pasture are going to give you the highest quality animal fat, but don't fear that because that is actually going to help stabilize blood sugar. You can also go for other saturated fats like virgin or extra virgin coconut oil. Um, there are other good for you fats. You can find a lot of this information on the Weston A. Price Foundation site, which I'm sure you will provide for us, Hilda. But anyway, I would say those those two things, get a good night's sleep, make sure you're getting enough hours of sleep. If you don't know how many hours of sleep your child needs, look it up. You may be surprised to find out that your nine-year-old needs, say, 10 hours. A lot of people that come into my office are surprised at how much sleep kids really need. Like I said earlier, they don't have an owner's manual for them. And so that would be my advice. Thank you for your time today. It's my pleasure. Thanks so much for inviting me. Thanks for listening today. Wise Traditions is brought to you by the Weston A. Price Foundation for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. What do you think of today's topic? Shoot us an email at podcast at westonaprice.org and let us know. You can also find us on Facebook, Weston A. Price Foundation, and Twitter at Weston A. Price. For more information on today's subject and our guests, go to our website, westonaprice.org, and click on the word podcast. 